The last few years have been rough on Intel, meaning a pretty disappointing lineup, the rebirth of their arch-enemy <coughs> AMD, and the separation from Apple, an important partner. These are just some of the obstacles the American manufacturer has to tackle if it wants to reclaim its importance and prestige acquired during the launch of the first core models. Today we'll bring to the table Intel Core i9-12900K, a highly respectable member of the 12th generation of core CPUs, nicknamed Older Lake. After months of waiting, countless rumors and opinions, it's time for us to see what Intel's newest CPU family has to offer. What can Alder Lake bring to a market which no longer welcomes Intel as it used to? Although the quest of Intel's 12900K seems tougher than what the previous generations had to face, I believe it has everything it needs to prove the haters wrong. To be honest, that's more of a spoiler, and if you don't believe me, then stay put, because I'm pretty positive that by the end of this video I would have successfully motivated my optimistic view. Alder Lake is the codename used by Intel for its 12th generation of core CPUs. The current release marks the transition towards a new manufacturing process and it brings along some new stuff such as support for DDR5 memory and PCI Express 5.0, all of these being the trademark of the new Intel Z690 chipset. Therefore, the first thing I want to address is Intel 7, which, despite its name, is still 10 nanometers. This is the manufacturing process which led to the birth of Alder Lake, back when the hardware enthusiasts used to call this 10 nanometer enhanced super thin. So the new CPUs include two core types, the high performance ones which support hyper threading, namely Golden Cove, and the weaker ones, the high efficiency Grace Mont with only one thread. This leads to a rather unusual configuration regarding the number of cores and threads, so Core i9-12900K features 16 cores and 24 threads. Weird, right? The 8 Golden Cove cores, called P cores, have hyper-threading and double the thread number. The resulting format is 8 by 16. A maximum of 24 cores is achieved by the Gracemon cores, aka E cores. The P cores, the fast ones, have a base clock of 3.2 GB, but in Turbo Boost Max they can even reach 5.2 GHz. Furthermore, the CPU has a basic PMP of 125 watts and a maximum MTP of 241. The desktop variants of Intel Alder Lake will be split into two categories. The first one sports 6P cores and the second one is basically this 12900K offering 8P cores alongside 8E cores. Compared to Core i9-11900K, the new series is about something entirely different, and that something is the cache memory. While the previous generation offered 16 megabytes of Intel Smart Cache memory, the Alder Lake Star integrates 30 megabytes of L3 cache and 14 megabytes of L2 cache. Take that, add the new cores the 12900K has been blessed with, and we get significant performance boost, despite the fact that 11900K can reach clocks 100 MHz higher than the newly released model. Let's talk about another innovation Alder Lake incorporates. It's about DDR5 memory support. However, there are some limitations I want to discuss. The new lineup is compatible with no less than four memory types. DDR5 4800, LP5200, DDR4 3200 and LP4X 4266. DDR4 will be supported by these motherboards, the entry-level Z690, the B and H models. On the other hand, the DDR5 will be available only for the high-end Z690 variants. This decision might confuse the buyers, but it's a good decision for the near future. Why? Because DDR5 modules will be quite expensive in the early stage, therefore they will appeal only to early adopters. On top of that, we will have to wait a bit longer until it becomes a standard, just like DDR4 is at this very moment. Along these additions, we can observe the fresh launch of PCI Express 5.0, with a bandwidth of 64GB per second. The high-end desktop CPUs will support PCI Express 5.0 x16 and PCI Express 4.0 x4. The low-end models will be compatible with the PCI Express 4.0 x12 and PCI Express 3.0 x16. Unfortunately, there are currently no motherboards capable of supporting the full capabilities of the PCI Express 5.0, but this will change in time once the PCI Express SSDs become more and more popular. In this respect, I don't think there will be any issue with grasping and making use of Intel's newest chip's power. 
Intel Core i9 12900K is the flagship model of the Alder Lakes lineup. Therefore, it features no less than 16 cores and 24 threads. We explained this and I hope you guys understood why Intel came up with such an unusual numbered system. However, at a closer inspection, we are about to discover that a new CPU is more than just a bunch of cores and cache memory. Let's start with the integrated graphics. This Intel UHD Graphics 770 comes with a base clock of 300 MHz, capable of reaching up to 1.55 GHz when pumped up to the max. The integrated solution has support for DirectX 12 and OpenGL 4.5, so it will be able to run the newest games and apps. Well, with some limitations, of course, since we are talking about integrated graphics. Here you can consult a complete and complex table of specifications. The information above outlines some really noteworthy aspects, which can be clearly seen right from the start. The chip itself gave up on its square shape, and now we are presented with a peculiar rectangle. For this, we use the Republic of Gamers AIO cooler. The kit itself includes different mounting pins, and in the case of 12900K, we only had to change the clamp. The plate of the cooler remained untouched, so in the future we will be able to use the current cooling systems with the Alder Lake CPUs once the manufacturers begin releasing mounting systems which are compatible with the new socket. So, the new CPU came with a new socket. This implies the use of another motherboard, plus DDR5 modules, which ended up in using a different testing platform. Asus was kind enough to provide us with the motherboard, the PSU, the GPU and the cooling system. Kingston helped us with the memory and storage, everything mounted onto the same OpenBench Lianli case. I'm sure you are curious to see the full specifications, so fret not, I got you covered. We use the ROG Maximus Z690 Hero motherboard. Fun fact, this is the first model of a lineup with ditches the numbering. In short, it's not Maximus 14 Hero, instead it just uses the name of the chipset. Being part of the Republic of Gamers family, the specs of this motherboard make it perfect for this brand new generation of CPUs. After all, it's a high-end model with DDR5 support, equipped with a 20 plus 1 power system, a total of 5 M2 slots, 2 USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports placed on the back of the board and a front USB port, 2 Thunderbolt 4 ports, 1 PCI Express 5.0 slot and Wi-Fi 6E compatibility. Obviously, you must promptly and carefully pick the rest of the components. For this, the Ryujin 360 AIO cooling system is the perfect choice if you want to tame the new processor's hunger, remember, 241 watts. While the details regarding the temperatures will be discussed pretty soon, I want to add a small observation here. For the Maximus Z690 Hero, this cooling system will be difficult to mount because of the bulky VRAM radiators, so you'll have some hard time moving around the cooling block. It's not impossible, but it's really counterintuitive and tedious. As for the memory kit, Kingston Fury Beast is composed of two DDR5 16GB each at 5200MHz. The kit and the motherboard went along blissfully and the simple configuration of the XMP profile boosted the frequency from 4800MHz to 5200. This memory kit features a CL40 latency, a huge value compared to Fury Renegade's 3600MHz and CL16 I personally use. How well they perform and how they impact the daily use remains to be seen. But I will talk about this in a dedicated video sometime in the near future. Last but not least is the GPU. Here is the RTX 3090, currently the world's most powerful mainstream graphics card, so this choice for this test configuration was a no-brainer, especially when we must never overlook the problem of bottlenecking. At the beginning of this video, I claim that this CPU has everything it needs to prove the haters wrong. And now the time to offer the arguments has come. How? Through benchmarks, of course. The results were absolutely stunning, especially in single-threaded tests, where Alder Lake is in a league of its own. For the sake of comparison, I picked the currently two most powerful CPUs in the market, AMD Ryzen 9 5950X and Intel Core i9 11900K, the company's previous flagship. But before digging into the actual comparison, let's have a look at the scores 12900K managed to pull. For the majority of users, these synthetic tests are rather worthless and represent just some scores achieved by some apps which do not necessarily reflect the actual daily performance. But now is the perfect occasion to throw Core i9-12900K into the pit and have it fight the AMD and Intel's current flagships. 
The results in the previous table will make more sense as we begin comparing the new CPU with 11900K and Ryzen 9 5950X. For the single core performance, we can see a 14% boost above 5950X and roughly 16% above 11900K. However, the real differences can be observed in multi-core tests. 12900K manages to catch up to AMD's flagship, offering a challenging performance, while being 47% faster than 11900K in the same benchmarks. 12900K not only manages to deliver a significant upgrade over its previous generation, but it also successfully equals the multi-core performance of the most powerful AMD CPU, while also defeating it in single-core results. This can only mean one thing. Performance boost in certain games and in single-thread apps such as web browsers, web servers, text editors and lots of other programs that use not the number of available threads, but the speed of a single core. For quite long, the AMD CPUs have been outclassing Intel in terms of productivity. However, the blue team has always fearlessly battled the most ferocious competition on the market when it comes to gaming. And in this respect, 12900K is by far the most powerful gaming CPU. Unfortunately, it is not relevant to directly compare it with one of the previously mentioned CPUs because of the DDR5 memory. Unless I get my hands on a Z690 motherboard with DDR4 kits, I won't be able to compare them one on one. For this testing session, I selected only three games, two of them being brand new releases and the other one being a rather old one. Therefore, Far Cry 6, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy and Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition were the subjects. All three were run using Full HD resolution with the graphics option set to maximum. In addition, to work up the testing platform even more, I turned on ray tracing without activating DLSS. As I've stated in the past, the games were played at 1080p, because otherwise the impact of the CPU is less prominent and all the hard work is laid upon the GPU, if you choose higher resolutions. Far Cry 6 achieved an average of 108 FPS, with the minimum frame rate being 97. The difference between these two is hardly notable and it proves the new CPU stability. Therefore, a desktop configuration which includes 12900K will easily offer gaming at over 100 FPS. Same thing goes for Guardians of the Galaxy. Even the difference between average and minimum frame rate is somehow more notable, 132 FPS versus 78, the overall experience stays the same. Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition was the only title which proved to be really challenging for the CPU. Even with an RTX 3090, the extreme graphics options were a bit too much. Nevertheless, with a minimum of 52 FPS and an average of 85, we can safely argue in favor of a consistent result, meaning the CPU will successfully stand its ground in every game, be it dependent on frequency or core number. Traditionally, the Intel CPUs require a pretty solid cooling system in order to withstand a TTP of over 200 watts. Logically, this applies to 12900K as well. At least this time it is not advertised with a false TDP value of 125 watts and the specifications clearly indicate that, at its fullest, 12900K can drain the PSU of up to 241 watts. Oh, and this is without considering the idea of potentially overclocking it. To be more specific, my advice is still relevant. You either pick up a high-end air cooler such as Be Quiet Dark Rock Pro 4 or a Noctua NHD15 or consider a water cooling system with at least a 280mm radiator. And no, a cheap 240mm radiator will not be effective and you risk thermal throttling. This is why we used an ROG Ryujin 360. As the name implies, it makes use of a 360mm radiator. The temperatures were recorded in a room with an approximate ambient of 23 degrees Celsius. When not strained, 12900K is really chill and cool, and if you enlist the help of the aforementioned high-end cooling solution, it barely exceeds the room temperature, for a total of 25 degrees Celsius. However, it's not that relevant, because even the simple act of opening the web browser raises the temperatures to 30-35 degrees. The real challenge arrived when I fired up Prime95 with the small FFT's preset, which works the cache memory to maximum, generating in turn even more heat. Even with that 360mm radiator, the CPU dangerously reached its limit, 88 degrees Celsius. And this was achieved using an open bench platform in a rather well-vented room, mind you. Things went a bit better in Cinebench R20, and it was only after I ran the multi-core tests three times that 75 up to 80 degrees were recorded. 
Although the benchmark seems to lack in optimism, if you were to use 12900K for gaming, things will end up much better. A simple Far Cry 6 benchmark with the previous settings, aka everything set on max and ray tracing on, show that the CPU never went past 54 degrees. Intel Core i9-12900K deserves its flagship status quo. It manages to fight on par even the most powerful AMD CPU, a really important and notable achievement, especially because Ryzen 9 5950X is built on 7 nanometers. Yes, the latter one has the same core count as Intel's new star, but with 8 more threads for a total of 32. If you carefully consider all of this, you will be able to paint a pretty comprehensive picture. Intel did a fantastic job and it deserves to have one of its CPUs placed among the market's most powerful models. But 12900K is not the only important factor, but the entire Alder Lake family. Among this one we also have i9-12900KF without integrated graphics, i7-12700K and KF, and Core i5-12600K and KF. Personally, this latest Core i5 sparks my interest even more, since it will be probably the most popular choice of all and it has the potential to outclass the excellent Ryzen 5 5600X in terms of gaming. It's time to discuss the price as well. This time things are better, as 12900K has an MSRP of $600, only $50 more expensive than AMD's Ryzen 9 5900X, a CPU that doesn't even get close to the scores hit by this Intel. More specifically, price and performance are excellently balanced and they will attract lots of buyers. To be honest, AMD really need a true rival to motivate them. Until the red team strikes back, I can only say this. All bow before the new king of CPUs. Core i9-12900K is a revolution, and I know I haven't said that in a long time. Intel showed us again they can come up with a powerful CPU at a really good price. Even if DDR5 is not really impactful at the moment and PCI Express 5.0 is still a bit pointless for unusual configuration, these technologies will become extremely useful in time when we will be able to fully take advantage of them. All in all, 12900K fights on par with Ryzen 9 5950X in performance tests, even if the first one lacks a threads. And if this is not a huge achievement, I don't know what else can be. And now let me hear your voice in the comments. Did it convince you? Is 12900K the true comeback Intel needed to strike right at AMD's throat? Will Intel actually earn their place into our hearts and systems once again? You tell me. For now, this has been Core i9-12900K and this has been today's video. And if you liked what you saw and want to support our work, feel free to subscribe to our Technicalities. Game on, guys!